Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you show us a true confession of who you are and who we are. Thank you for giving us meaning and joy in you. We confess that we wish to make something of ourselves, to define ourselves apart from you. By your word and sacraments, join us to you, so that our life exists wholly in you. In your name we pray. Amen. The text for our meditation this morning, the Holy Gospel, appointed for the fourth Sunday of Advent, is recorded by the evangelist St. John, the first chapter beginning at the 19th verse. Please rise in Jesus' name. This is the testimony John gave when Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny. He confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, Who are you then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? No, he answered. Then they asked him, Who are you? Tell us so we can give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord, just as Isaiah the prophet said. They had been sent from the Pharisees. So they asked John, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ or Elijah or the prophet? I baptize with water, John answered. Among you stands one you do not know. He is the one coming after me, whose st sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. These things happened in Bethany beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Advent, in part, is a season of preparation for the festival of Christmas. The main point, as we've already heard from our children, is the birth of Jesus. Today, in the town of David, a Savior was born for you. He is Christ the Lord. This Christmas message is a true cause for joy. Of course, some might not feel that joy. Even Christians might not feel that joy. But just because we don't feel it doesn't mean we don't have it. In fact, those who want that joy, who yearn for that joy, do have that joy. So our joy comes in the message itself. Through the word, hearing the message, our hearts rejoice in Christ. That's our reason for coming to the place that other Christians are gathering with us, the place where the word is spoken and sung, especially when we don't feel it. We want to, and so we keep coming back. And that itself proves that we do have it. Because no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. No one goes looking for Jesus unless he already has faith in Jesus. On the other hand, a false kind of joy, a fleeting and worldly kind of joy can be had in the festivities of Christmas. And as I'll always say, that not any aspect of our fun and our joy with family and friends is necessarily evil or sinful in itself, but in fact all of those things are blessings given to us by God, and we should enjoy them. But as soon as those things become more than blessings that remind us of the love of God, as soon as they supplant God and His Word and His worship so that those, those things become less important, then our joy is actually wrong. And it's wrong simply because it's a lie. Witness the true confession of St. John the Baptist. He denies anything about himself. He is nothing. One day he would say, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and listens for him is overjoyed when he hears the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. As Christians, you and I, like John, are all about Christ. This means, first of all, that we are nothing without Him. And second of all, that everything we do has meaning in Him. This double confession should be on every Christian's lips and heart. Who am I? I'm a sinner. Who is Jesus? Jesus is my Savior. Now, many would be willing to say the second part, but perhaps a little bit reticent to say the first part. 
If we were honest about our sinfulness, what are we worried about? What makes us clam up and refuse to say, I have sinned in this way or that way? Why don't we want to admit it? There's a common opinion in the world that we're all pretty well garbage human beings anyway, so why don't we just try to get along, make the best of it? But you see how already that denies the existence of God. Because we're not only dealing with our connection to other human beings. God created us in His image, designed to be in a relationship with Him. We are literally nothing without Him, for in Him and from Him and through Him are all things. Just consider the reality that God made everything, literally everything. So to think that we are anything apart from Him is the height of foolishness. We have no choice but to compare ourselves to the standard that God has set there for. And so we regularly pray, we poor sinners confess to you, O God, not only that we have been conceived and born in sin, but also that throughout life we have often and in many ways offended you, our Lord and Maker, in thought, word, and deed, so that you could, with perfect justice, reject and condemn us for all eternity. Confession like this, telling the truth about who we are, goes hand in hand with telling the truth about Jesus. Hear how St. John weaves it together in his first epistle. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. So without confessing our sin, we do not have the truth in us, we do not have God's word in us, and that means that we don't have Jesus. He called himself the truth, and he's also called the word. He is decidedly not a liar, and he says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Confess the truth that God already speaks. Make your words aligned with his word. Who are you? The priests and Levites asked that of John. What do you say about yourself? And let our confession be equally true. Let us confess and not deny, but confess, I am a sinner. I have sinned. I am nothing. Christ is everything. And that's what we do when we confess our sins. We point to Christ. It's a double confession. Why then do you baptize, they ask John. What right do you have? What right do you have to tell me what you say is the truth? What right do you have to tell me that I or any, what anyone else does is wrong? What right do you have to claim to worship the only true God? John's answer in his defense was simple. I baptize with water. Among you stands one you do not know. He is the one coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. So John claims to be nothing. He's as significant as plain water, something all of us can get from our kitchen taps. Same is true of me as a pastor. I have similar tools, water, bread and wine, an old book. The man who uses these tools is as significant as what amount to plain common materials. The same is true of all of us as human beings. God made us out of dirt. And he said, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. We are as significant as dirt. Now look what happened to that dirt that we are all made out of. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. The breath of God himself fills you and all human beings, so that you are living beings. Similarly, hear what St. Paul says about God's word, all scripture is God-breathed. And that simple water of baptism is powerful because it is connected with the water, the word that Jesus breathed out. Therefore, go and gather disciples from all nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and by teaching them to keep all the instructions I have given you. The bread and wine are what Jesus say they are as he breathed these words on the night that he was betrayed. This is my body which is for you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Just as little as dirt can spontaneously come alive all on its own, that's how little that you and I can make ourselves anything. But God breathes into you by his word and sacraments. I'm not. <coughs> Jesus is everything. And he gives me his life. I belong to him. And therefore, everything that we do has meaning in him. It's not John's authority in the baptism that matters. He just moves the water. But baptism has meaning because of Jesus. If you consider it further, the fact that he has hands that can move the water in the first place is a work of the God who made those hands, who made the water and brought the people of Israel to that land across the Jordan where they would be baptized by John. For we are God's workmanship, said St. Paul, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance so that we would walk in them. There's a lot of people in the world looking for meaning in their life. Sometimes we find that meaning in our jobs, our hobbies, our families. But all of those things have their meaning, too, from the ultimate source of meaning. What a blessing is your job. Opportunities for industry, reward, and work. What a blessing are your hobbies. Chances for relaxation and rest, recuperation, connection with others. What an extraordinary blessing is your family. People who love you and to whom you can show love. All of those blessings come with obligations, too. Why the obligations? Because God, God wishes you to, and He has designed you according to His will, formed you like a potter forms clay so that you would function according to His purpose. We can confess with the words of Isaiah the prophet We are the clay, you are our potter. All of us are the work of your hand. That's a confession of our purpose. We're nothing without the one who made us. And he made us with a purpose. Because we're made with God's purpose, that purpose points to his purpose ultimately in dealing with all humanity. St. Paul calls us the fragrance of Christ for God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To some, we are the odor of death that is a prelude to death. To others, the fragrance of life that is a prelude to life. That's the message of the law and the gospel. Law, which convicts us of the death that looms over us for our sin. And the gospel, which nourishes us with the life that Jesus won for us. In the cross of Christ, you can see this fragrance, like the ascending smoke of the sacrifices in the temple, God said about those sacrifices, it is a pleasant aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Such pleasant aromas turn God's <coughs> wrath aside. The aroma of Christ was the final sacrifice, so that God's wrath was turned away from all humanity forever. This is the fragrance of death and life. Death is what we deserve all on our own. But instead... We smell the free, sweet fragrance of life because of who Jesus is. So it makes you think that you get to be this fragrance for other people. God fashions you in a specific way. So that you can present Christ to your neighbors, your co-workers, your boss, your family. All those blessings that God gives you so that they also can be saved. It doesn't mean that you're constantly talking about Jesus making his name every other word on your lips. It doesn't mean that you have to pepper your conversation with Bible passages or make sure that you wear a cross that everyone can see really obviously in front of you. But it does mean that you do everything that you do in the name of Jesus. When you're rocking your children to sleep, it's because they're in Jesus' arms. When you work 
for your employer, it's because Jesus served you and wants you to serve others. It means also that you will look for opportunities to share the gospel with your children and your family. You bring them to church. You have devotions together. You sing hymns with your co-workers, employer, or neighbors. By your Christian life. By doing your work with the abilities that God has given to you. You show your joy and life in Christ, in God, the one who has given you those relationships, and who will continue to put those opportunities before you to confess Christ even more directly. And you might not always feel like sharing. You might not always feel the joy of the gospel or the joy of Christmas. But you do always have. It's not something that depends on your feelings or your ability to hold on to it, your own strength. It's all about Christ. You have a true source of joy in Him. So that even if you don't feel it, you have. When I or anyone else or these children tell you today in the town of David, a Savior was born for you. He is Christ the Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forevermore. Amen.